Recording in progress.
All right, it is just about five o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, all right, so we had left off last time. We were working a problem, uh, problem nine, and we had used Ohm's analogy. Um, let me make sure I could see everybody. Okay, we had used Ohm's analogy um, to calculate the temperature at a particular location within this within the cylinder. So we calculated it at TR1. Um, and now we need to find what's called the critical radius. So the critical radius is the radius that's going to maximize the heat transfer. And it seems a little bit almost counterintuitive that increasing the radius would of that that outer sleeve would increase the radiation be or increase the radiation, increase the rate of heat transfer because right that that um sleeve has a certain um thermal conductivity uh or you know resistance to thermal conductivity to it because of the thickness right of the of that sleeve um so that would be kind of fighting against that uh heat transfer rate but as the thickness increases, the surface area along the outside is going to increase. And so you've increased the area through which heat transfer can occur. And so you've increased the, the heat transfer rate. And so what's going to happen is you're going to get something like this. In fact, I think, uh, can I add a little sheet here? Okay. Yeah. Actually, it's fine. Let me just uh, I'm gonna take what we did yesterday and just kind of move it over to the side. All right. So what you're gonna get is you're gonna have I oops. I put Q on this axis and then R on this axis and it's not just r it's r2 so we're 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 looking at the dependence of q on that outer radius r2 and so what we're going to have well the smallest it could be would be r1 because that means that their the thickness is zero right um and so but what we're going to have is we're going to have something that looks like this and so somewhere We're going to maximize. Oops, that's awful, but we're going to maximize that crit that rate um, that rate of heat transfer, and the radius at which that occurs is your critical radius. So I'm going to call this CR, but this this would be right where R2 is equal to that critical radius. So we've really got kind of two options here. A little bit smaller. Keep that in my head there. Um, I've got really two options here. Option one is I um, can think, okay, well, I'm trying to maximize the heat transfer. I've got this, I've actually got this equation for Q. This is what we did yesterday. We calculated or got a, an equation for Q. Um, and so that's actually where I'm going to start. I'm going to start uh, with this guy right here. Um, I'm going to rewrite it, I think, just to kind of keep it keep it in the frame here um, all right so I have oops. so option one option one is I'm going to take that equation for Q might not be 80 watts anymore right because I'm trying to maximize this value um, but it would be so it's T at R1 minus 30 degrees. And then we had those two thermal resistances, right? So we had um, this a little bit smaller. We had natural log of R2 over R1. And I'm actually going to write that R2 in red. R2 over R1 over and then it's 2 pi lk plus then that thermal resistance to convection which was 1 over h times 2 pi r2 times l 
I don't know why I've got that one there. Let's put that one right there. All right, so there we go. So that's my equation. And we know that the way that we would calculate um, where a function reaches a maximum or a minimum would be to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. So that's what we're going to do. Or that's what we could do, I should say. So what we would do is we would just say, OK, let's Actually, I'll leave that the way it is. Uh, no, let's keep it. Let's go back. So I would take that Q. I'm going to delete it now. If that's OK. So I'm going to erase this. I'm going to take the derivative. And I'm going to take the derivative with respect to the parameter that I'm interested in, in varying, which would be R2. And then I'm going to set that equal to 0. And that's going to allow me to find the minimum or the maximum value of, of Q. Of course, I'm looking. You know, if I look up here, it's 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 going to be a maximum. All right, so just kind of refresh what we just did. We took the derivative of Q with respect. to that outer radius R2 and set it equal to zero. Right, and the and that works because that that helps us find that would help us find R2 where Q is a maximum. So that looks kind of ugly, um, and it is, right? Um, so the other option is to try to make our life a little bit easier. Um, instead of thinking of things like, okay, well, thinking of things in terms of the Q and maximizing the Q, let's look at minimizing the thermal resistance because a minimum thermal resistance would maximize that Q. So I'm going to take... I'm going to take the derivative. Well, come on. I'm going to take the derivative of that thermal resistance again with respect to R2. and set it equal to zero. In other words, I'm going to find R2 where that thermal resistance is a minimum. All right. So the, the thermal resistance is the denominator of that, that thing up in option one. So, all right. Cool. Let's see if I can get this guy. I'll take that down here. And I'm going to take this whole thing. And I'm going to take the derivative of it with respect to R2. And then I'm going to set that whole thing equal to zero. And that will allow me to calculate the R2 where the thermal resistance is at a minimum. Okay, easy peasy, right? All right, kind of. I mean, it looks a little bit ugly, but it's not too bad. So um, I'm going to keep in mind that I've got, all right, let me just kind of rewrite this just maybe a little bit. Um, so yes, I've got D. the derivative. So the first one is going to be, it's going to be the natural log of R2 over 2 pi LK, 
plus the natural log, and actually it's not plus, it's minus the natural log of R1 over 2 pi LK. So I'm just rewriting that natural log R2 over R1 um, because it's going to make the math a little bit easier. And then I've got 1 over H times 2 pi, again, R2, this is the variable that I'm taking the derivative with respect to, and then I'm going to set everything equal to zero. All right, so for the derivative of the first one, the derivative of the natural log of something is just one over that something. So it's going to be, I'm going to bring my zero over here. So this is going to be one over, and I've got two i l k there's an X over there as well, or not an X. <laughs> R2, apologies. And then the derivative of the middle term is just going to be, well, it's the derivative of essentially a constant. And so that one's going to be zero. And then the other one, so I've got um, one over H2 pi L times the derivative of uh, one over R2. So that's R to the negative one. So that this would be, uh, negative uh, 1 over h2 i l and then it would be r2 squared all right so I could do a few things number one I can divide out that 2 pi l because same in both terms. I also notice that I've got 1 over R2 in both of those terms on the right. So if I multiply both sides of the equation by R2, I get rid of this. Um, keep in mind, there is there's still this K here. He hasn't gone away. Um, and then I get rid of this guy right here. And so now the only terms that I'm left with I've got this R2, I've got the K, and then I've got the H. Um, and so what I'm going to end up getting is that that critical radius, I'm going to put him in R as R2, so our critical radius that will maximize that heat transfer is going to be K over H. So 0 0.00625 meters and that's just that's what it is right we could have changed the numbers around and it would have been k over h okay so let's see i think one more yeah one more ohms analogy and then we'll move on to heat generation okay Again, just yell at me if I've if you need me to go back. I'm happy to do so. All right, so we have a pipe wrapped in material A. So that's gray. Um, that's this this one right here. Um, and then you've got material B, which is an orange on the outside. And we want to find the heat transfer rate per unit length. So this is, I know it looks sort of like short and squat, but pretend that it's longer. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to like put a little dot, dot, dot. Just pretend it's long. Okay, some length L. And then we want to find some stuff. So we want to find, uh, again, the, the heat transfer per unit length. So Q over L. So this will, will be A. And B, we want TR1. We want TR2. And then we want TR3. So the, the temperature at each of those radii. All right, so let's kind of look at it real quick. Just make sure that we understand what's going on. So in the middle, we've got convection, right? So you've got some fluid flowing through at 320 degrees Celsius, and you've got a convective heat transfer coefficient associated with it. Um, then you've got two layers, one gray, one orange, and then on the outside, you've got convection. Um, so you've got a cooler liquid, five degrees. So you, yeah, you, when you calculate that Q, it's, it's, it's going out, right, like this, right? Flowing from what's hotter to what's colder. Perfect. Um, and then I'm going to throw an assumption over here. 
steady state, Q dots equal to zero, uh, one dimensional. There we go. All right, perfect. So let's go ahead and put our, our circuit analogy together because we've checked the boxes for steady state, one dimensional, Q dots equal to zero. And so uh, Ohm's analogy is perfectly acceptable to use uh, to calculate those that Q and that those discrete temperatures. Um, so it looks like I'll have one, two, three, four, five temperatures, right? I've got the T infinity at one and two, and then I've got TR one, two, three. So, all right, so I'm gonna draw my little circuit analogy. There's one temperature node, there's another, there's another, there's another. One, two, three, four. I need one more. All right. So I've got T infinity one. So that's my 320 degrees Celsius. Um, then the next one is going to be my TR one, which I don't know, but I'm going to calculate. Then I got a TR two. Then I have a TR three. And then the very last one is going to be my T infinity two which is five degrees Celsius. And I need to define those thermal resistances. So the first one is gonna be due to convection um, and it's gonna be one, remember if we look on our, our equation sheet, R by convection is one over uh, HA. Um, and of course your area for the inside of cylinder is gonna be two pi R times L. And we just need to be cognizant of which R that we're talking about. So for that first resistance on the inside, it's going to be the inner radius. So it's going to be uh, 1 over um, H times 2 pi R1 L. For the second one, all right, so now we're looking at a uh, conduction, conductive resistance, so C-O-N-D. Um, and remember on your equation sheet, it shows this as the natural log of R2 over R1, right, outer over inner. And then we've got, uh, uh, what is it? Um, it'll be two, two pi KL, two pi KL. All right, perfect. So the first one is going to be the based upon, well, numerator is easy because it's between R1 and R2. So this one doesn't change, but natural log of R2 over R1 over 2 pi, and it's Ka because it's the gray one, right? Mm -hmm. Ka, and then we've got an L. Perfect. And then the next one is going to be through the orange, um, and that's going to be between R2 and R3. So we've got natural log R3 over R2, and then we got a 2 pi KBL. Um, and then the very last one is due to convection, and of course that's based upon the area on the outside, so the area based upon R3. So I have um, 1 over H times 2 pi R 3 L. Perfect. So the very first thing, and I'll go ahead and put a little, here's my Q. And in fact, I'm, I'm calculating things in terms of Q over L. So I'll write it as here's a Q over L. So when I'm defining that Q, all right, so I'm going to have to base this upon temperatures that I know. Uh, so I've got on the top, it'll be 320 minus five. And then I just have to sum up each of those resistances. So I won't write the numbers because it'll just get really ugly. Um, but I got, I probably should have just written this the one time, but I've already done it. One over two pi HR1L plus natural log of R2 over R1 over 2 pi k a l plus natural log r3 
over R2, and then I've got 2 pi KB L, one more, oops, at plus 1 over, and then I get a 2 pi H R 3 L. Um, and of course, I'm not interested in Q. I'm interested in Q per unit length. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 1 over L. And so it will not matter that I don't know those L's. All right. So it really is. It's plug and chug at this point. So I end up getting 120.7. So 120.7, and this is going to be in terms of watts per meter. Perfect. Awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hannah, thank you for paying attention. Yes, on the top, it is 320 minus 5, and that's in degrees Celsius. I'm sorry about that. All right, so that's A, and now I need to just do the same thing, but just, you know, calculate um, thermal resistances, like calculate, apply that Ohm's analogy, maybe just to this little section right there. Um, so I'll do it for the first one, and then I'll just give you TR2 and TR3, because it really is, it's more of the same, just applying that Ohm's analogy between two temperatures, uh, where you know one of the temperatures and one of them you don't. So. I know that that QL is the same all the way through. So QL, again, 120.7 watts per meter. That's going to be equal to, so I'm looking at that highlighted little section, um, and that's going to be 320 degrees Celsius minus my TR1, which is the thing that I want to know, over just that one resistance. 1 over 2 pi h r 1. And there is no L because remember he got kind of divided out over there. All right. And so it's just one equation, one unknown. So I get a TR1 of 307.28 degrees Celsius. All right. Uh, okay. And then I've got TR2 or TR, yeah, TR2. So T at R2, this one is 307.2 degrees Celsius. Okay, and then TR3, down the correct governing equation, but miss the actual value. Um, so yeah, so the question that Aiden asks is, if we write down the correct governing equation, but we miss the actual value, how much of a deduction is that? So if you, if it's obvious that you, you've written down the governing equation, so say you wrote down this whole thing, and then you didn't, you, you forgot a parenthesis or something in your calculator, I don't know, like a point or two. I'm mostly interested that you know how to do it and not that you can keep your cool in the 75 minutes that you have on the test. Yeah, cool beans indeed. All right, 23.6. Yeah, and I'll just put a little, little note. It's the same strategy. There we go. All right, so let's move on to a problem that's got some heat generation. We got spoiled with the with Ohm's analogy. It's kind of nice because, yeah, super easy to use. Um, but yeah, sometimes sometimes you have heat generation and can't use it. So, <laughs> all right. So let's see. All right, so we have heat is generated. Is there still a reason that T1 and T2 were similar? So let's look. Uh, uh, 
Okay. So between TR1 and TR2. So TR1 and TR2, keep in mind, I'm going to zoom in on the picture. They're really similar. Right. So it comes down to this guy and that guy. Yeah. Um, so the thermal conductivity of that first layer is, is really high. Um, and so if you think about what Ohm's analogy tells us, so Ohm's analogy, or not Ohm's analogy, but what Fourier's law tells us. So negative K, A, DT, DR. Um, so this guy is high. This guy, DT, doesn't have to be as big. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so let's keep on going. All right, so we have a one centimeter thick stainless steel plate. Uh, so we have our thermal conductivity given to us and then we have a Q dot that's given to us as well. So let's go ahead and draw our picture here. Perfect. All right. So it's one centimeter thick, right? Here's L, 0 0.01 meters. Um, we have a K value. Perfect. So K is 20, 20 watts per meter Kelvin. And then we have a, a Q dot. So here's my Q dot, a squiggly one, 500 megawatts per meter cubed. If the two sides of the plate are maintained at 100 and 200 degrees, we want to find some stuff, the temperature at the center of the plate. So I'm going to choose to put the 200 degrees on the left-hand side just because it, it really doesn't matter um, as long as I'm consistent. I just like to put the hot side on the left hand side um, and then the cold one on the right hand side. All right, so I'm going to call this is T at X equals L. He's 100 degrees. And the other one, T at X equals zero. is going to be 200. Perfect. Um, and so it's wanting to, we're wanting to figure out the temperature at in the center of the plate. So I'm going to need to go back to my heat diffusion equation and get a temperature distribution. So I need the temperature at R, not R, at X equals L over two. All right, so yeah. So what can I assume? I can assume, well, they didn't tell me how things were changing with time. Steady state um, and one dimensional in the X direction. So what my temperature distribution is gonna look like is, well, maybe, maybe like that. So you've got this, you got this Q dot that's going to keep it up uh, in the middle, but then on the sides it should go down. Um, okay, so so we have Q dot. It's not equal to zero. So no Ohm's analogy. Boo. Alrighty, so let's apply our, apply our heat conduction equation. Um, so I have second derivative respect to x, second derivative <clears throat> with respect to y, second 
second derivative with respect to z. Plus our q dot over k. And that's going to be equal to 1 over our thermal diffusivity. <clears throat> and then I've got my partial of the temperature with respect to time. A lot of these things are going to go away, right? It's one dimensional. So this guy and that guy go away and then it's steady state. So that last guy goes away. All right. So I have, can get rid of the partial. Now it's just a regular old second derivative. Equal to, it'll be a negative Q dot over K. And so I'm going to multiply both sides by dx, take the integral, and I should be, I'm going to get rid of my color coding here. I should be left with a dt dx equals negative q dot x over k plus v1. I take the derivative again, right? Multiply both sides by dx, take the derivative, and I should be left with now my general equation t as a function of x, and it'll be negative q dot x squared over 2k plus v one x plus another constant of integration, c2. All right, so I got my general solution over there. I'm gonna highlight him because I'm very happy about him. Got him. So there's the general solution. And now we need to apply our boundary, uh, boundary conditions to figure out what that, um, figure out what those constants of integration are. So my first boundary condition, I'm gonna pick the one at x equals zero because usually things with a zero in them I do that first, that's gonna make my math easier. So I have, all right, fine. T at X equals zero, 200 degrees Celsius is gonna be equal to, and let's look at my equation. So it's at X equals zero. Um, so if I, if I plug things in here, X equals zero, that means that 200 degrees T at X equals zero is just gonna be equal to V2. Perfect. So that's another thing. I'm going to highlight that. Next boundary condition is, of course, going to be at X equals L. It's at 100 degrees. So 100 degrees is equal to, right? So at X equals L. Yeah. So at x equals L, I've got negative Q dot L squared over 2K plus V1L plus C2, which now I know is 200. Perfect. And so I can calculate and see what C1 is. Um, I don't know. Well, C1 is going to be, I got I to gotta calculate it, don't I? See if I have it somewhere. That'd be sweet if I did. Somebody's probably figured. Old, please. Do I have it? <laughs> Apparently, I don't. I want to say this morning it was one hundred and fifteen thousand or negative one hundred fifteen thousand. It was it was a big number, but regardless, it's going to be that one hundred degrees Celsius minus the two hundred degrees Celsius plus. 
my Q dot. Q dot was my was not a big, not a small number. Five hundred watts, uh, and it's megawatts actually. So five hundred times ten to the six watts per meter cubed times L squared. L, L was 0 0.01 meter. That squared divided by 2K. So 20 watts per meter Kelvin. I want to make it obvious that that's right there. Did you get? Oh, sweet. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. And we're dividing that by 0 0.01. Awesome. Thank you, Hannah. So 115,000. Perfect. Um, so if we look at, you know, if we look at this equation over here, even if I, if I don't know if I was kind of lazy, um, I can reason out what those units were supposed to be, um, or I can cancel things out, but they should be they should be in degrees Celsius per meter in order for the temperature T of X to be um, in degrees Celsius. So degrees Celsius per meter. Okay, perfect. And then all we needed to do was figure out, fi figure out, figure out what the temperature at X equals L is, uh, L, or L over two. So, so the temperature at uh, what, 0 0.005 meters? Plug that guy in. We get 462.5 uh, degrees Celsius. Perfect. Right. Perfect. All right. So let's go to the next one. The next one's a little bit annoying. I'll, I will tell you that. Go ahead and warn you up front. All right. So let's walk through this. So we have the air inside of a chamber is 50 degrees Celsius. So the inside is on the right of the side of the picture. So this temperature is 50 degrees Celsius. And this thermal conductivity is 20 watts, or not thermal conductivity, the convective heat transfer coefficient is 20 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And then we have a 0 0.2 meter thick wall. Wall's got a thermal conductivity associated with it of 4 watts per meter Kelvin. And then it's got this uniform heat generation. So we do have a Q dot, and that's going to be 1,000 watts per meter cubed. And then we've got, okay, to prevent any... Oh, where did the morning class end? <laughs> uh, where did the class end? Let me hold on a minute. Uh, we ended halfway through problem 14. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So to prevent any heat generated within the wall from being lost to the outside of the chamber, uh, and the outside is at 25 degrees Celsius. And then the convective heat transfer coefficient is 5 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Perfect. A very thin electrical strip heater is placed on the outer wall to provide a uniform heat flux. So, as you can see, you've got a colder environment on the left-hand side. And so you would expect that heat's going to be lost by convection. Um, but what that strip heater is doing is it's providing enough heat flux to negate that effect. 
that's what's going on. And so So the strip heater it's providing the same effect same effect as as if I had insulation on that one side. Okay. So, you know, still got a thermal conductivity, still have a Q dot, um, still got that convection on the right hand side, you know, all that. But the fact that that strip heater is there, again, it's negating the heat loss by convection. So it's like it wasn't even there. Like nothing's going on over there. Okay. And this same length, right? Still, still L is equal to 0 0.2 meters. All right. And so what we're going to do, let's look at what it's asking from us. So we want to find the temperature distribution. Okay. Well, we could do that right now. So we want to find the temperature distribution. So remember, it's the same effect as what I just drew with the insulation on the left hand side. And we've seen that sort of thing, right? So the temperature is going to be highest at X equals L. And then, of course, there's going to be convection. Um, and so your temperature distribution should look something like that. Done. All right. So let's get the next guy. So the next guy is asking, what are the temperatures at the wall boundary? So T at X equals zero and T at X equals L for those conditions. Okay. So for B, we just got to find, we'll find T as a function of X and plug in numbers. When I say plug in numbers, plug in boundary conditions and plug in numbers. Okay. So I'm going to kind of ignore the stuff up there with the strip holder, uh, the strip heater, um, the Q double prime and all that stuff. I'm just looking at the figure that I drew with the insulation on the left hand side. All right. So the governing equation is going to be derived or the general form of that um, governing equation, your general solution it's going to be the same as the previous problem. In other words, it's this, that same, that same thing. Boundary conditions are different, but it's the same general solution. So if you don't mind, I am going to just rewrite that. So I'll say be the previous problem. get that general solution. Oops. Okay. All right. So our solution, our general solution is T as a function of X is equal to uh, negative Q dot X squared over 2K. Uh, plus, and we had a C1, X plus C2. And now I'm going to get my first boundary condition. So the first boundary condition is that oh, I've got no heat transfer um, at X equals zero. So D, uh, DT, DX at X equals zero, that's got to be equal to zero. And so my derivative of this guy is going to give me, uh, so this will be negative Q dot X over um, 
over k. Right? Is that it? <laughs> I feel like I'm missing something. Yeah. <laughs> Stupid. Um, plus my c1. So all that's going to give me is that c1 has to be equal to 0. I'll highlight that guy. I'm going to highlight my general solution. That's nice. Okay. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, C1. No, because it's the derivative. So the derivative of T of X would be negative q dot x over k plus c1 so c1's got to be zero yeah yeah yeah. and then my next boundary condition would be oops something like that that's got to be due to convection so second boundary condition i'm actually going to put the negative k here so my negative k dt dx at x equals l so i know that that has got to be q by convection so that's got to be or heat flux by convection so it's going to be the h right that guy h times t at x equals l minus my t infinity All right, and so now I need to like plug in some stuff. So I know my derivative. So on the left hand side, I've got negative K and then the derivative is going to be um, negative Q dot L over K. Um, and then of course C1 is zero. And then this is equal to my H1 times so it's t at x equals l which means i need to go back to that general governing equation up there that's highlighted in yellow so t at x equals l would be negative q dot l squared over 2k plus uh well c1 is zero so it'd just be plus c2 oops all right, so that's that's my t at x equals l, and then I got to subtract out my t infinity. That guy. All right, so it's kind of ugly, kind of ugly. Let's see if I do have a an actual value for c two. That would be like super sweet. No, I don't. But that's okay. That's all right. We'll just we'll just rearrange it. Um, yeah, I really just can't clean it up too much. But I got a C2 is equal to so I'll have I'll have Q I'll have Q dot L. The K's are going to cancel out. The negatives are going to make a positive. I'm going to divide through by that H1. And then I'll have a plus q dot l squared over 2k plus that t infinity all right so it's ugly and i guess i need to probably need to plug in some numbers but it's fine it's fine the way it is for now because the only thing i really needed I can plug in and get, all right, well, at x equals zero, what's it going to be? Temperature at x equals zero. 65. And the temperature at x equals L is equal to 25. Perfect. All right, so that's B. So 
I'm going to give you just a, a second to get make sure you got that down. Oh, and then I find something else. All right, so let's go back to the back to the problem statement because I just blasted on ahead. <laughs> so I've got this guy, I've got this guy. So now we want to determine the value of that Q double prime. So we're going back, going back to our figure up there. We want to find that that uh, find that value that has to be supplied by the strip heater so that all the heat generated within the wall is transferred to the inside of the chamber. What they're asking is, what is the value of that Q double prime such that it's just going to negate the Q by convection? So, you know, I like to be, um, I mean, I know the, the direction of that blue arrow is going to be going out, but let's just say that we're not even thinking. Let's just say we're on autopilot and we're just going to draw all the cues going in one direction. Okay, so I'm going to draw this. This is a cue convection at X equals zero. And this guy is my cue uh, double prime naught. That's what's supplied by that strip heater. Okay. And I'll, I'll figure out pretty quickly that the arrow should have been flipped around, but that's, fi that's fine. Let's just go with what it is, okay? So I'm going to set that equal. Q by convection at X equals zero is equal to that Q not double prime. So let's go back down here. I think I'm going to put it here. So this is going to be part C. So I'm going to say, all right, that um, yeah, this guy has to be equal to this guy. At x equals zero and so the way that I've drawn my arrow remember it was going from left to right so when I define it oh and it's gonna have a little little flex term so this is gonna be H this is at the outer surface times T at x equals uh, uh, zero minus um, I'm sorry it's flipped I'm so sorry flipped. Darn it. I was talking about just doing it the same way every time and then I screwed up the order there. So this is T infinity on the outer side minus T at X equals zero. Well, we already figured out what x equal uh, temperature at x equals zero is. It's 65. Okay. So I end up I end up getting that that q double prime is equal to. So this guy t not that was 25. 25, yeah. Um, and H is five, so this is a negative 200 watts per meter squared. That's going to tell me right away that I flipped the arrow and it should have been the other way. So yeah, so it's it's not taking away; it's supplying. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's it's supplying 200 watts per meter squared. Okay, so that's that one. Okay, now let's go to part D. So I'm gonna scroll up if that's if that's okay. I'll scroll back down. 
Oh, that's perfect, actually. All right. So it's saying, all right, so now the heat generation in the wall switches off. Okay. So Q dot is now equal to zero. However, that heat flux is still 200 watts per meter squared. Okay. Um, what would the steady state temperature uh, be at T at X equals zero for the outer wall surface? So let's, let's look at that. Okay. So for part D, we're saying now Q dot is equal to zero. But that Q double prime is still equal to 200 watts per meter squared. Right. I'm regretting my decision to be like consistent. And yeah, it's it is supplying. So it's it is it's going to be a positive number. But um, so our Q dot is now zero. But the Q double prime is still supplying that 200 watts. Um, so now we can use Ohm's analogy. So let's put a circuit together. All right. So I've got one, two. So the first node is going to be um, on the left hand side, and this is going to be my 25 degrees Celsius. So out there the on the outer, uh, was it inner or outer? I can't remember. What did the picture say? That's the outside chamber. All right. Um, and then I've got a resistance to convection. So it's going to be one over H and I'm just going to leave it as H outer and let's draw my circuit in terms of flux because that way I don't have an area associated with that. So the thermal resistance um, would be one over H A, but if I draw things again in terms of flux, um, then the math is going to work out or the units will work out. So if I have a Q um, and actually remember, now I know I had flipped my arrow. So I know. Um, you know what? I'm not regretting my decision. Let's keep with it. Yeah. So remember how I had drawn my arrow up here? Right here. I'm going to keep it like that. So here's that guy. So this guy is my Q by convection at X equals zero. And then I have this one right here. This temperature node is T at X equals zero. So that's fine. And by the way, I'm going to keep this negative. Just I'll be consistent all the way through. I know that it's supplying energy and not taking energy, but I'll, I'll, I'll be consistent. All right, so that's T at X equals zero. And then I'll have a thermal, a resistance to conduction. Oops. And then I'll have a T at X equals L. And then I'll have another resistance out here. And this is going to be my uh, T... Uh, T infinity inner, and this was the 50 degrees. All right. So by convention, remember, um, I'm drawing all my, I'm drawing all of my, uh, my arrows for the heat flux in the positive 
uh, x direction. So I'll have a q convection at x equals zero, but then I'll also have a q by convection at, and this is a heat flux, um, this is at x equals l, and they're actually not the same thing because remember I've got that strip heater um, that is providing um, flux as well. And so if I drew, if like this was my y-axis, and so by convention, I'm gonna draw it up, but I'm gonna remember that that value of q not double prime, I had calculated to be negative 200 watts per meter squared. So that's fine. All right. So now you can see that like what's flowing in from the left hand side, the way that I've got my arrows drawn, they branch off. And so I can see, all right, well, that Q by convection at X equals zero This is going to be equal to, all right, so I've got my u naught plus this guy. U, gosh, by convection at x equals L. All okay. Do need a little bit more. Shrink it just a hair bit. Do that. Probably going to mess it up. Oh, I think I'm going to mess it up. That's fine. All right, so that's fine. All right, so now I'm going to plug in numbers. And I'm going to try to, maybe I'm going to highlight some stuff and just try to show where things are. So the Q by convection is going to be defined right here. All right, and by Ohm's analogy, the thing that I used was, okay, so that heat flux is going to be difference in temperature, so it's going to be 25 degrees Celsius. So it's 25 degrees Celsius minus T at X equals zero. And you might say, well, wait a minute, I, I thought we figured that figured that guy out. And we didn't yet because these temperatures are the temperatures at x equals 0 and x equals L um, when the Q dot is still going. But we've just switched it off, so we want to see what happens. All right, so, and then underneath, I've got the thermal resistance. So this is 1, oops, 1 over... convection coefficient there and then this is equal to oh I got my my uh, negative right my negative uh, 200 watts per meter squared so I'm going to keep that negative 200 and it's watts per meter squared and then I'll have the Q by convection on this side so it would be well I need to define it between two temperatures that I know, or at least one of the temperatures I know. Um, and so that means I have to define it through this whole thing, because I don't know what T at X equals L is anymore. All right. So on the bottom, I'll have two thermal resistances. So those thermal resistances will be, all right, so I'll have the thermal resistance to uh, conduction uh, for the first one so that's going to be L over K and then for the other one it's going to be 1 over that convection coefficient all right so L over K plus 1 over that convective heat transfer coefficient, and then the temperature difference is going to be T at X equals zero minus that 50 degrees. I know it's getting a little crowded over here.
All right. All right, I probably wanted to that one too. All right, so it looks ugly, and yes, there's some kind of annoying uh, algebra that has to happen. But if you look at that equation, I know every single thing in there except t at e x equals zero. So it's just one equation and one unknown. So that's going to give me that t at x equals zero. Goodness, sorry, that t at x equals zero should be 55 degrees Celsius. All right. All right. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Next one's not as bad, I promise. This one is the, this one's a, kind of an annoying one so I've got this one and then part of problem 14 all right so now we have a plain wall of thickness 0.1 meter so let's go ahead and this better and more forgiving of my bad writing all right so here's my plain wall thickness L, so L is equal to 0 0.1 meter. I've got a thermal conductivity of 25. So 25 watts per meter squared Kelvin, having a uniform volumetric heat generation of Q dot, so 0 0.3, and it's megawatts per meter cubed. It's insulated on one side and the other side is exposed to a fluid at 92 degrees. So it doesn't really matter, matter which side that I pick, but it would be nice to have things equal to zero at X equals to zero. I think that will make my math work out better. Um, and then it's exposed to a fluid, a little T infinity over here, 92 degrees Celsius. Uh, heat transfer coefficient is 500 watts per meter squared Kelvin. All right, and so I'm supposed to find the maximum temperature in the wall. So that's gonna be at X equals zero. I'm gonna, again, find T max. And that's going to be t at x equals zero because we've seen this kind of scenario before and the temperature distribution is just going to go like that it's going to sort of look like half a parabola that does not look like half a parabola but just pretend that it does yeah all right so i'm going to assume steady state and one dimensional heat transfer but i can't use ohm's analogy of course because i have heat generation all right, so my solution, same thing. Apply my heat diffusion equa equation. So I'm going to apply a heat conduction, heat diffusion equation. To get the general solution. And I'll say C, previous problem. I think. Have done this one yet? Yet. So our general solution, T as a function of X is equal to negative 
q dot x squared over 2k plus b1x plus b2. And actually, I think we had a very similar problem before because our boundary conditions, yeah, that previous problem, part A or part B at least, we had, okay, well, negative k dt dx or d, just dt dx is fine as well at x equals zero. Well, that's going to be negative k. Oh, and all that's equal to zero because I've got insulation on that one side. Um, and this will just be negative q dot times zero over over k. I guess everything was multiplied by negative k, but it's not going to matter. Plus c1. And so c1 is going to have to be zero. Perfect. So got that guy and I got that guy. I'll just go ahead and kind of cross him out just so I keep remembering that C1 is zero. And then my other boundary condition is a convective boundary condition. So I've got negative K DT DX. At X equals L has to be equal to the convection. So it's going to be T H times T at X equals L minus uh, that T infinity. Put a little blue there, T infinity. All right. So I got to plug some numbers in. Sure. Um, but this will be negative K times negative Q dot L over K. Z1 was zero. And this is equal to H times T at X equals L, which is going to be negative Q dot L squared over 2K plus RC2. Um, and so that's the T at X equals L. That's that one. And then we're going to subtract that T infinity. Perfect. All right. Well, I haven't really solved for it yet. I mean, I've, I've, I'm like one step away, aren't I? Um, but C2, I'll go ahead and put it here. So C2 ends up being, so I'll have the negative K, the negative K, those are going to cancel out. Um, and so I'm going to be left with, let's see, Q dot L over H plus Q dot L squared over 2K plus that T infinity. And I have all those numbers, so it's really just a plug and chug. And so, well, I guess now I've got enough information to, to calculate what T at X equals zero is. Um, so this ends up being 212. All right. All right, problem 14. So if you recall, I mentioned that we got halfway through this problem this morning. So yeah, 21.2, no, 212. Sorry, James. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at this next one. All right. So we have a long cylindrical rod of diameter 200 millimeters um, with a thermal conductivity of point uh, 0.5 watts per meter Kelvin. So I'm going to try to draw this. <laughs> Fine. So there he is. Okay. And then, so the radius here. Uh, 
R1. So it's a diameter of 200 millimeters, so a radius of 100, so 0 0.1 meter. M has a thermal conductivity. I'm going to call this K1. So K1, 0 0.5 watts per meter Kelvin. And then he also has some volumetric energy generation, so 24,000 watts per meter cubed. The rod is encapsulated by a cylindrical sleeve. Okay, so dot out here, so I'll take advantage of that. It's okay. <laughs> Not great, but it's okay. And then this radius right here, R2, so it says, and I know the problem statement, let's look at uh, my stupidity. It says that outer sleeve has a diameter of 400 meters. I suspect that's 400 millimeters. It's not 400 meters, 400 millimeters, which means that our radius is gonna be 0.2 meters. So please, please, please just make sure you make a note of that. Otherwise that makes no sense. Okay. All right. Um, and then the thermal conductivity, I'll call this K2. K2 is equal to uh, 4 watts per meter Kelvin. And then we've got some convection going on out here. So, sure. The outer surface of the sleeve is exposed to cross flow of air. Air is at 27 degrees Celsius, and we've got a convection coefficient of 25 watts per meter Kelvin. And I'll, there we go. So we want to find a couple of things. Um, we want to find the temperature at the interface between the rod and the sleeve. So what we're looking for is we want to find want to find T at R1. We want to find the temperature at the interface between the sleeve and the outer surface. It's it's uh, just the, the temperature at the outer surface. That's what I'm looking for. It's just such a, I don't know, T R2. And then we want to also find the temperature at the center. So at R equals zero. Now, yes, I've got some heat generation and that's all well and good, but I will note that there is, you know, it's steady state, one dimensional in the radial direction as far as heat transfer goes. And then in the sleeve, that Q dot is equal to zero. And so it doesn't, you know, there's, there's, um, I can still apply Ohm's analogy in the sleeve. So in the green part, but not the middle part because there's energy generation or Q dot in that, in that middle part. Okay. So, so I'm going to apply Ohm's analogy in the sleeve in the green part. All right, so let's draw our little thermal circuit. So the first temperature node is going to be at the interface right there at TR1. Okay, and then I'll have T at R2, but then I also have at T infinity. I don't know why I put him right there. We'll put him on the bottom. T at, R, uh, T at infinity. So this temperature I do know, T 27 degrees Celsius. And so if I drew my heat transfer, if I drew a, a Q going through here. All right, 
So that Q... Do I know? Actually, I think it's going to be fine. So I've got Q, and I think I'm going to, since I don't know the length, I'm actually going to put that Q in terms of Q per unit length. All right. So let's define our thermal resistances. So the first one is going to be the natural log of R2 over R1 over 2 pi K. So 2 pi, and it would be 2 pi K L, but remember I'm, I'm going to define things in terms of Q over L. So the L is going to go away. And then for the second thermal resistance, that's due to uh, convection. So this is going to be 1 over 2 pi, um, and it's on the outer radius, so it's going to be 2 pi r2. And it would be times L, but remember, I'm, going to, I'm putting things in terms of Q over L, so it's going to divide on out. Um, oh, and there's an H there as well. Sorry about that. That, that one. Okay. Do I have everything? I have everything except that Q over L. So I need Q over L. So I'm going to do an energy balance. Good old fashioned energy balance. On the rod. Because that's going to be related. It's going to be related to that Q dot. So with the rod itself, right, that middle part where I've got heat generation, it's going to be, all right, general energy balance E dot stored equals E dot in minus E dot out plus my E dot G and it's still steady state. I don't have anything coming into the rod, only out. And so you could see that those two things are equal to one another. So I'll have an E dot out is equal to E dot G. So let's try to relate those things. So I know the E dot G, let's put a Q dot there. So I've got 24,000 watts per meter cubed. And then I know my Q, my E dot out, let's put that in terms of Q over L. So my Q over L, this guy would be in terms of watts per meter. Uh, so it looks like I need to multiply the right hand side. If I want to get watts per meter, I need to multiply it by an area. Um, so the volume is going to be the cross-sectional area of, of that rod times the length. So it's going to be pi r1 squared pi r1 squared times the length. But we're just going to multiply this guy by pi r1 squared because you can see we've divided through by by that length. Let's move him a little closer. Okay. And so now I've got an equation for that Q double prime. And so I can plug in So I can say that Q over L, which is 24,000 watts per meter cubed times that pi uh, R1 squared. That's going to be equal to, going back to my thermal circuit, it's going to be TR1 minus T infinity over the resistances. So natural log R2 over R1 over 2 pi K 
plus one over two pi r two times h and again it kind of looks ugly but i do actually have everything in here i've got the r's i've got the k's i've got the h's the only thing i don't have is that tr1 and that's the thing i'm looking for so that tr1 is equal to 71.79 degrees celsius okay and we'll stop right there it's an it's just a it's just a matter of like working down the line i can get tr2 i'll go ahead and give you that because it's the same kind of thing take your q over l it's the same all the way through and apply ohm's analogy now apply it between tr2 and t infinity or tr1 now that you know it and tr2 i've got a tr2 of 51 51 degrees and we'll stop there and tomorrow we'll uh we'll finish up we'll get t as a function of r yeah and then we'll move on to fins okay all right thank you guys y'all have a wonderful night um i'll hang out for a little bit if you do have questions so yeah thank you thank you can you go to number nine i just want to make sure i got everything sure 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 thank you no go back i'm sorry okay i'll go back i'll, I'll go back here's problem nine can i zoom in is this okay and yeah, I'll take a picture and then go back. Okay. <laughs> and again, don't don't forget it's on the it's on the playlist online. So. Okay, you good. Okay. All right, I'll go Thank back. You. Yep, yep, yep. A uh, quick conceptual question on nine. You don't have to go back to it, but um, if I understood correctly, we were trying to maximize the heat transfer through that insulation. By finding the critical R. Yeah, I mean it's you know maybe that K maybe that uh, that um, covering is not necessarily meant to insulate it, right? Okay. Yeah. Oh, because yeah, that was my next question. Like, why would you? Why would you do, do that? that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess if you're trying to remove heat from it, right? Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Has everybody copied everything down? If you have, I'll hang out, but I'm going to put my timer on. Um, I have a question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So on that last equation, you didn't use L because everything was divided by L, right? According mm -hmm. to the left side? Yes. Okay. So essentially what you did is you, you multiplied. If I had had an L right here, and right here, um, by having this L right here, it would have it would have gotten rid of those L's, so it wouldn't have mattered. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll I'll put my timer on, but just yell at me, okay? All right.